where did we come from? What was before the Big Bang? To us, this is wonderful and charming and compelling. This is what makes us get up and go to work every day, is to try to solve the mysteries of the universe. And that's time. Mr. Ham, a response? Hey, Bill, I, I just want to let you know that uh, there actually is a book out there that actually tells us where matter came from. <laughs> and the very first sentence in that book says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. When we're talking about origins, we're talking about the past. We're talking about our origins. We weren't there. You can't observe that, whether it's molecules to man evolution or whether it's a creation account. When I mean, you're talking about the past, we like to call that origins or historical science, knowledge concerning the past. Here at the Creation Museum, we make no apology about the fact that our origins or historical science actually is based upon the biblical account of origins. People, by and large, have not been taught to look uh, at you know, what you believe about the past uh, as different to what you're observing in the present. You don't, deserve the, you don't observe the past directly. Uh, even, you know, w w when you think about uh, the creation account, I mean, we, we can't observe God creating, we can't observe the creation of Adam and Eve, we admit, admit that. We're willing to admit our beliefs about the past. But see, what you see in the present is very different. Even some public school textbooks, actually, well, they sort of acknowledge the difference between historical and observational science. There is no distinction made between historical science and observational science. These are constructs unique to Mr. Ham. We don't normally have these anywhere in the world except here. And your assertion that there's some difference between the natural laws that I use to observe the world today and the natural laws that existed 4,000 years ago is extraordinary and unsettling. The kind in Genesis 1 really is more at the family level of classification. For instance, there's one dog kind, there's one cat kind. Even though you have different genera, different species, that would mean, by the way, you didn't need anywhere near the number of animals on the ark as people think. You wouldn't need all the species of dogs, just two. Not all the species of cats, just two. As he said many times, there are 7,000 kinds. Today, uh, the very, very lowest estimate is that there are about 8.7 million species but a much more reasonable estimate is it's 50 million or even 100 million when you start counting the viruses and the bacteria and all the beetles that must be extant in the tropical rainforest that we haven't found. So we'll take a number which uh, I think is pretty reasonable, 16 million species today, okay? If these came from 7,000 kinds, that's, let's say we have uh, 7,000 subtracted from 15 million, that's 15,993, we have 4,000 years, we have 365 and a quarter days a year. We would expect to find 11 new species every day. So you'd go out into your yard, you wouldn't just find a different bird, a new bird, you'd find a different kind of bird, a whole new species, a bird, every day. A new species of fish, a new species of organisms you can't see, and so on. I mean, this would be enormous news. The last 4,000 years? People would have seen these changes among us. And then the catastrophe of Noah's flood. If there was a global flood, you'd expect to find billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. I had to say that because a lot of our supporters would want me to. And what do you find? Billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. You'll hear a lot about the Grand Canyon, I imagine, also, which is a remarkable place. And it has fossils. And the fossils in the Grand Canyon are found in layers. There is not a single place in the Grand Canyon where the fossils of one type of animal cross over into the fossils of another. In other words, when there was a big flood on the earth, you would expect drowning animals to swim up to a higher level. Not any one of them did, not a single one. If you could find evidence of that, my friends, you could change the world. And so you'd expect these different species up here, but there's limits. Dogs will always be dogs, finches will always be finches. This would be a reasonable place to look for an, an animal, a fossil of an animal that lived there. And indeed, scientists found it, Tiktaalik, this fish lizard guy. And they found several sp specimens. There's no, this, it wasn't one individual. In other words, they made a prediction that this animal would be found, and it was found. So far, Mr. Ham, and his worldview, the Ken Ham creation model, does not have this capability. It cannot make predictions. 
But you see, we certainly observe radioactive decay, whether it's rubidium strontium, whether it's uranium lead, uh, potassium argon. But when you're talking about the past, we have a problem. I'll give you a practical example. Uh, in Australia, there were engineers that were uh, trying to search out about a coal mine, and so they drilled down and they found a basalt layer, a uh, lava flow that had woody material in it, branches and twigs and so on. And when uh, Dr. Andrew Snelling, our PhD geologist, sent that to a lab in Massachusetts in 1994, they used potassium argon dating at dated to 45 million years old. Well, uh, he also sent the wood to the radiocarbon section of the same lab, and that dated to 45,000 years old. 45,000 year old wood and 45 million year old rock. The point is, there's a problem. Uh, if you find 45 million year old rock on top of 45,000 year old trees, maybe, maybe the rock slid on top. Maybe that's it. That seems much more reasonable explanation than it's impossible. You can't observe the age of the Earth. You don't see that. You see, again, I emphasize, there's a big difference between historical science talking about the past and observational science talking about the present. Yes, we admit we build our origins of historical science on the Bible. Uh, the Bible says God created in six days. Uh, the Hebrew word yom, as it's used in Genesis 1 with evening, morning, number means an ordinary day. Adam was made on day six. And so when you add up all those genealogies specifically given in the Bible, yeah, from uh, Adam to, uh, to Abraham, uh, you, you've got um, 2,000 years from Abraham to Christ, 2,000 years from Christ uh, to the present 2,000 years. That's how we get 6,000 years. And I claim there's only one infallible dating method. It's a witness who was there, who knows everything, who told us. And that's from the word of God. And that's why I would say that the Earth is only 6,000 years. And as Dr. Faulkner said, there's nothing in astronomy, and certainly Dr. Snelling would say there's nothing in geology to contradict a belief in a young age for uh, the Earth and the universe. Now, as far as the distance to stars, understand this is very well understood. We, it's February. We look at a star in February, we measure an angle to it, we wait six months, we look at a, that same star again, and we measure that angle. It's the same way carpenters built this building. It's the same way surveyors surveyed the land that we're standing on. And so by measuring a distance to a star, you can figure out how far away it is, uh, that star, and then the stars beyond it and stars beyond that. There are billions of stars, billions of stars, more than 6,000 light years from here. A light year is a unit of distance, not a unit of time. There are billions of stars. Mr. Ham, how could there be billions of stars more distant than 6,000 years if the world's only 6,000 years old? We are here uh, in Kentucky on layer upon layer upon layer of limestone. I stopped at the side of the road today and picked up uh, this piece of limestone that has a fossil right there. Now, in these many, many layers, uh, at, in this vicinity of Kentucky, there are coral animals, uh, zo fossil, zoosanthellae. And the, when you look at it closely, you can see that they lived their entire lives. They, they lived typically 20 years, sometimes more than that, if the water conditions are correct. And so we are standing on millions of, of layers of ancient life. How could those animals have lived their entire life and form these layers in just 4,000 years. There's not, there isn't enough time since uh, Mr. Ham's flood. <clears throat> uh, my scientific colleagues go to places like Greenland, the Arctic, they go to Antarctica, and they drill into the ice with hollow drill bits. It's not and we pull out long cylinders of ice, long ice rods. And these are made of snow. And by long tradition, it's called snow ice. And snow ice forms over the winter as snowflakes uh, fall and are crushed down by subsequent layers. They're crushed together and trapping the little bubbles. And the little bubbles must needs be ancient atmosphere. There's nobody running around with a hypodermic needle squirting ancient atmosphere into the bubbles. And we find certain of these cylinders to have 680,000 layers, 680,000 snow, winter, summer cycles. How could it be that just 4,000 years ago, all of this ice formed? Let's that would mean we'd need 170 summer, winter, summer cycles every year for the last 4,000 years.
we find enormous stands of bristlecone pines. Some of them are over 6,000 years old, 6,800 years old. There's a famous tree in Sweden, Old Tico, is 9,550 years old. How could these trees be there if there was an enormous flood just 4,000 years ago? It's an extraordinary claim. There's another astronomer, Adolf Cattell, who remarked first uh, uh, about the reasonable man. Is it reasonable that we have ice older uh, by a factor of 100 than you claim the Earth is? We have trees that have more tree rings than the Earth is old. That we have rocks with rubidium and strontium and uranium uranium and potassium argon dating that are far, far, far older than you claim the Earth is. Yes, I take Genesis as literal history, as Jesus did. And here at the Creation Museum, we walk people through that history. We walk them through creation, a perfect creation. Uh, God made Adam and Eve, land animal kinds, sea creatures, and so on. And then sin and death entered the world. So there was no death before sin. Uh, that means how can you have billions of dead things before man sinned? The nature of consciousness is a mystery. I challenge the young people here to investigate that very question. Uh, Bill, I do want to say that there is a book out there <laughs> that does document where consciousness came from. And uh, in that book, uh, the one who created us said that he made man in his image and he breathed into man and he became a living being. Mr. Ham, a new question. Uh, this is a simple question, I suppose, but one that actually is fairly profound for all of us in our lives. What, if anything, would ever change your mind? Hmm. Well, and so as far as the Word of God is concerned, no, n no one's ever going to convince me that, uh, that the Word of God I I is not true. And I would ask Bill the question, what would, uh, what would change your mind? I mean, you said even if you came to faith, you'd never give up uh, believing in billions of years. I, I think I, I quoted you correctly, you said something like that uh, recently. So that would be also my question to Bill. Time. Mr. Nye? Uh, we would just need one piece of evidence. We would need the fossil that swam from one layer to another. We would need evidence that the universe is not expanding. We would need evidence that the stars appear to be far away, but they're not. We would need uh, evidence that rock layers can somehow form in just 4,000 years instead of the extraordinary amount. We would need evidence that somehow you can reset atomic clocks and keep neutrons from becoming protons. You bring on any of those things and you would, uh, inf you would change me immediately.